Hello, I'm Tom Stapledon, and I've got another talk here on behalf of the Friends of Williamson's Tunnels. Uh, this time, the talk is going to be about Williamson's Deep Quarry uh, at Paddington. Uh, we don't tend to think of it so much as a quarry because it was underneath a set of buildings, but basically it started off as a very deep 60 foot deep quarry right alongside a street in Edge Hill. Now this, uh, a lot of you may have seen, this is the um, only painting we have of the set of tall buildings that Joseph Williamson built at the top of Paddington and on the corner of Highgate Street. We think he built these about 1836. Um, the buildings in themselves are odd enough, but it's what went on below the buildings, which is um, really quite unusual and very difficult to explain. I've spent years trying to make sense of what went on below here. And um, I've got my own theories. And of course, we can't get Joseph Williamson back or any of the men who, who worked for him to explain exactly how they did what they did or why. Uh, but we think we know why, really. But uh, it, it is still a mystery. So this is the deepest section of the quarry. Um, that uh, was created below where that set of buildings went up. Now, Joseph Williamson came up here about 1836, we believe, to build this set of four uh, tall buildings, which were going to be commercial buildings. Um, they look like two pairs of buildings, actually. They, they look as if number 126 and 124 Paddington were of quite a different design to number 120 and 122, but they're all butted up as a group, perhaps built slightly at different times, perhaps one after the other, or perhaps they all went up together. We, we really don't know. But uh, what concerns us here at the moment is this space, which lies below where number 126 and 124 stood right at the top of uh, Paddington. And we rediscovered these in 1999, spent uh, many years digging them out and eventually got right down to the bottom uh, in November 2016 to find we were faced with this deep quarry. And um, this quarry is just as it was left on the day when the quarrymen walked away, basically. Um, four great blocks of stone were being worked on all at the same time. Uh, you just seen one there. At the end, this middle one here is that one there, and then a third block of stone there, all being channeled around and separated into blocks before being broken up into smaller pieces and hauled out. At the far end through there at a slightly higher level is a fourth block of stone that was also being worked on. Um, an awful lot of work, um, just... Uh, channeling around these things with a pickaxe. There was no mechanical help at all in those days. You can see how tall this is. Um, this, this whole bottom um, level of the Paddington cellars is um, 12 metres high from roof to floor. And the whole quarry goes down to 60 feet below ground, in fact. Now here you can see where they've been channeling around. An awful lot of work for one man with a pickaxe around three sides of a block. And then the next process would be that um, once they channeled around each block of stone, they would start to dismantle it bit by bit, if you like. And let's say that with a block of stone like this, the next step would have been to drill a series of holes in a straight line across there. And it was only be done with uh, hammers and chisels, long handled chisels, and a sledgehammer, hit it, turn it, hit it, turn it, hit it, turn it, going down several inches. I'm not quite sure how far. And then when you've done that with a series of holes, the next step is you put in these um, uh, steel wedges and feathers, they're called, uh, and you tap them down gently a little bit at a time, tap, 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 one after another. The quarrymen knew what they were doing. They could read the stone and the grain in it. They knew what they were dealing with. And eventually they would reach a point where great mass of stone would break away from the chunk. And those became the blocks of stone that would be hauled out uh, off down to Williamson's workyard where they would be shaped to the requirements and dressed 
and go off for building stone. A lot of it may have been used by him, but he probably also parted with a lot of stone to other people. So that was the process. At each time you've dismantled a block like this, then you would go down another couple of feet and dismantle the next block down. And this whole process went on right up from ground level, where the stone was uh, either outcropping on the surface or just below the surface in his day, uh, all the way down to 60 feet down below ground. Step by step by step. Same process was used out in the open, but Joseph Williamson, of course, had to be different. And he was doing his quarrying straight down in the ground, making life much harder for himself and his men. But he had the manpower and he wanted to keep them busy. This is an interesting feature here in this corner. These little triangles. Pickaxe has a curved blade. You'd be chopping away in one direction. God knows how long it would take to cut out one channel like this. And then you'd be chopping away in the other direction at 90 degrees to it. The pickaxe never get, quite gets to the corner. And you're left with these little triangles in the corner where the pickaxe head doesn't reach. We see these all over the place in Williamson's underground structures. There's another one. This is uh, an area in the adjoining chamber where um, the whole stone block has already been demolished. And this is what remains in this corner. You even see the pick mark still in there, just uh, as it was when they were chiseling it out. Um, this at the back of that um, um, chamber, we call it the gypsum chamber still for some reason. Um, they are starting to channel along that side there, not completed channeling along the back of this uh, higher block and then channeling along the other side of it as well. Work in progress, not completed, but when they channeled around that block, they would have done the same thing there and dismantled it bit by bit until it was all gone. Now then, the question is, how did they get the stone out? I believe what happened in the beginning, and this is all my own opinion, nobody else's, um, but I, I hope most people will agree that this has to be the way it was done. I believe he picked his spot at the top of Paddington, marked out a big rectangular area that was going to be the excavation of a quarry and over which would be the footprint of the buildings he was going to put up. Obviously, the footings of the buildings would be on the solid rock uh, and not within the quarry, but just around the uh, the shape of the quarry. It was a rectangle. And um, I think what happened was he started off by digging down, taking out the stone, maybe 10 feet, maybe 20 feet, because what he's done is he's put in two levels of uh, working cellars below these commercial buildings that he was about to put up. Uh, we know they were working cellars because they're beautifully constructed out of brick arches, two arches side by side with a, with a, with a joining area at one end, uh, very intricate arches. And these have been finished off with nice sandstone slab floors. So they were obviously designed to be walked on, designed to be used for storing goods. And that's two levels of cellars from the ground going down maybe 20 feet. That was fairly straightforward. What happened then is that, or maybe at the same time, or maybe immediately after, the buildings themselves started to go up around the footprint of this quarry and went all the way up until it constructed five-story buildings. In actual fact, the, um, the pair of buildings above this end of the, um, the quarry were four-story, and the other pair, slightly further down Paddington, were five-story on the slope. Um, but anyway, then they've decided to carry on quarrying below, and that's when it becomes a bit mysterious. They went down all this distance and still taking the stone out while buildings were going up above. Now, I believe all this happened fairly quickly because when I study old maps of this area, sorry, street plans of this area, going back through the years, there is never a street plan that shows a quarry on this site. The same thing goes for uh, several other areas that we have excavated, like the banqueting hall below Williamson's house, uh, another one down the street, another one on the other side of us. There's no time that these deep excavations ever show up on any street plans as quarries. I believe that's because Williamson was taking the stone out in the quarries fairly quickly and then immediately vaulting over the top of them and then building on top with cellars and, uh, and tall buildings. And so there was never an opportunity for the next um, um, 
the next man who was drawing up a, a street plan to ever see it as an open quarry. They obviously were quarries, but they weren't open to the air for any great length of time. There's a, there's a distinct possibility that Williamson was not really supposed to be taking the minerals, that didn't have the mineral rights on the land that he was occupying with his leases. Uh, he may have been forbidden, um, but he was doing things on the quiet, keeping a low profile, and perhaps he was taking out the sandstone when he wasn't really supposed to be, which is why he kept a low profile, swore his men to secrecy about what they were doing, and covered over his excavations very quickly uh, before anybody noticed what he was doing. And then he could still build on top of the land. So nothing was lost except that he gained all the sandstone and kept the men working. So um, as you can see in this corner of the, the one we call the uh, Coke Chamber, this is um, up towards the, um, the line of Highgate Street. Uh, there's this uh, enormous great buttress here going from floor 60 feet down and right up through the roof of here and on upwards through the two levels of cellars. Um, I'm calling it a buttress, but perhaps this is the what would be the, the end of the building line in this direction. And beyond it, this area is recessed by between six and seven feet. I'm thinking that this area was outside of the building line of the building and was open to the air right until the end. It looks as if this section of brickwork has been put in at a later date and that it was originally open to the air. There's got to be a reason for this shape with this buttress and this recess. And looking at the other end, uh, not so easy to see this, so this is looking up in the air, a buttress right opposite the one at the other end, there, and then a recess going back another, um, I think this is between five and six feet at this end. And at this end, you can very clearly see that there's a break line in the brickwork there, level with the end of the buttress. So there's a good reason why these two buttresses are here, or rather a good reason why the two recesses go another five or six feet on, perhaps beyond the building line of the buildings. I hope I'm making sense. Looking at this photo, uh, opposite this buttress, you can very clearly see the break line in the brickwork. This is the main arch. The brickwork is obviously nicely knitted, but with this last section, five or six feet, the bricks are butted up, but not knitted in, which makes it fairly obvious that this has been added at a later date. There's another one looking straight up in the air at it. You can see the break line again. And then when we look at the other end, unfortunately, uh, we, we did some um, a little bit of repointing work of the ceiling uh, before we emptied this chamber too far, while it was still possible to get at the ceiling. And some pointing was done in this area, which makes it a little bit less obvious where the break line is. But there is a break line in the brickwork there opposite with the end of the buttress, exactly the same as at the other end. So I believe this section was added in at a later date, in fact, right at the end. It's a long, long way they went down here. I I have come to the conclusion that what happened was the buildings were going up, the cellars were in, the excavation downwards, taking the sandstone out, was proceeding deeper and deeper. And I think an enormous great scaffolding structure built out of uh, timber uh, and rope, because that's how they did it in those days, uh, hemp rope tying timbers together a great scaffolding structure was built in this end for instance it could have been the other way around but um and this would have had as they went down it would have been extended downwards and there would have been regular wooden platforms all the way down and internal ladders all the way down to the bottom for the men to climb down into the excavation and to climb out again and it was a long long way uh this must have been quite a quite an interesting place to work and possibly very dangerous as well. Uh, there are various places where we see little slots in the wall as well at this end. I'm not really showing them uh, properly here. There is one there and there are several others uh, which may have been used for temporary staging as they built the, um, the scaffolding structure downwards. And that would have been for the men to get in and to get out again. And then at the other end, let's say at the other end, this would have also been open to the air. And at the top on the surface, there would have been a winch a great rope wound on a, 
a wooden drum, for instance. Might it have been powered by manpower? There certainly weren't any um, uh, mechanical aids like a like a steam crane or anything like that by, by the time Williamson died. So um, it had to be manpower or possibly even horsepower. Um, and um, using a winch at this end, uh, tools and equipment could have been lowered down into the excavation and taken out again. Um, the the waste sandstone, the small bits of crumbly stuff that was left over during the quarrying would have been hauled out in uh, in, in buckets. And um, obviously the great blocks of stone that were being cut out uh, from the quarry bottom would have been hauled out this way, straight up to the, uh, to the surface and away. And then uh, I believe, I, I really believe this, that the whole process was in full swing right up until the end. They were working on four blocks of stone all at the same time. They weren't scaling the operation down. They were still on the go. And it's it's obviously just come to a sudden stop uh, at some point. And I've come to the conclusion, and most people I speak to, uh, when I take visitors around and I explain all this to them, they mostly agree with my um, take on this, that uh, the chances are it all came to an end on the day that Williamson died. So I have this vision that the foreman came down here into the excavation on the 1st of May, 1840, and said, right, lads, everybody out. We're finished here. The old man's just died. Because nobody else was daft enough to pay the men to do what Williamson had been paying them to do all those years. He was the one who wanted to keep the men busy. He wanted to help them give them dignity, give them work, teach them trades, put food on the table. And this was his way of doing it. And he's gone to exceptionally silly lengths uh, in this particular excavation, keeping keeping the men digging down to 60 feet below buildings. But uh, it was his way of doing things. And um, I believe it only stopped on the day he died. So that's my take on the uh, the story of what happened here. I could be completely long, wrong. I, I'd love to be able to... Uh, sit down with Joseph Williamson and discuss it with him or uh, even some of his men that worked for him to find out how exactly they did what they did and uh, and why and when. But uh, yeah, I believe that this uh, is what happened. And these two ends of this enormous excavation were bricked in right at the end when the quarrying stopped. And this great space below here was never really to be used again. Uh, because it only existed as a quarry. It did possibly have a later use uh, as a water storage facility, and we can think of uh, a good reason why it would be, but that would have been an afterthought, perhaps, as it started to fill up with water after the, uh, uh, after the quarrying finished. Perhaps they were pumping water while they were quarrying. Who knows? But that's just about it. That's all I've got to uh, say on the subject. I hope you uh, uh, think that I've given you a reasonable... Uh, explanation of what might have happened but if anybody's got any ideas of alternatives we love to hear them uh, i love discussing it with visitors who come down if anybody has any different ideas that throw us off in a different direction of thought that would be great so uh, give it some thought so that's uh, just about all i've got to show you thanks for watching